fiction, a love potion is designed to create feelings of love. So if you want someone to fall in love with you, you give them this pink smoky juice. And it's kind of messed up if you really think about it because you're making someone love you against their will. So you're like forcing them to like be with you. And I don't like that very much. Oh, actually, before we really get started, because we're talking about potions, this actually reminds me of something that I did as a kid. And tell me if you did this too. Whenever I would have like bath time, I would sit in the bath and I would make my own potions out of like shampoos and soaps and like body wash and stuff. So I would like mix it all together and create this like cool potion. Potion. Did you guys do that too? Okay, it was like so much fun to like mix the different colors together and like mix the scents and stuff. I'm also just crazy though. Okay, so like I said, love potions have been pictured in different like fiction and mythology, and one that's very popular is actually in Harry Potter. The love potion in that movie is called Amortentia. I hope I'm saying that right. All the Harry Potter fans, don't come for me. Amortentia is the most powerful love potion in the world. It is distinctive for its mother of pearl sheen, and steam rises from the potion in spirals. Amorentia smells different to each person according to what attracts them. And I think that's what's really cool about the love potion in Harry Potter is that everyone smells it differently. So whatever you like, you'll be attracted to it. So I guess my love potion would smell like pizza and that's okay. Actually, comment down below what love potion would smell like to you. It basically has to be like your favorite smell in the entire world. So for example, in the movie, Hermione Granger smells fresh cut grass, new parchment, and Ron Weasley's hair. And Harry Potter smells treacle tart, the woody scent of a broomstick handle, and Ginny Weasley. So those are the things that those two characters smell, which I find so interesting. Now let's get into the history of people who actually tried to create love potions in real life way back in the day. Love potions date back to the 16th century. So the recipes back then actually called for parts of animals, which is so disturbing and sad. These recipes would call for anything from the fat of a snake, the head of a sparrow, the blood of a bat, the heart of a pigeon. Those were like the common things to put into love potions. But like, don't do that, okay? Animals are precious and we must protect them at all costs. Flowers have also always been associated with romance, and a common love charm method was to plant marigold flowers in the footsteps where the object of your affection has walked. So if you see like your crush walk by through the grass or something, you would literally plant these flowers where he stepped and then he would love you. Now there were also some people back in the day who would put human ingredients into these love potions. So you know when you hear the phrase where someone says, oh I put my blood, sweat, and tears into that cake, which basically means it just took like a really long time. They put all their effort into making a cake. Well, back in the day, people would actually put their blood, sweat, and tears into a love potion. <sighs> Ew. And there's so much more history we could go into about love potions, but a lot of it is actually really disturbing and gross. So if you want to do your own research, that's totally your call. But right now we're going to be getting into the very creepy love potion creepy pasta. This is about a 21 year old man who buys a love potion to win over the affection of his crush. And things go very, very, very wrong. So this man went on a holiday to the Bahamas and when he arrived at his hotel, everything looked beautiful. Everything was to his liking. The weather was perfect. The beach was immaculate. The hotel was high class. Basically this Bahamas resort was everything he had ever wanted. So he went to his room and tried to make himself look as handsome as possible. So he did his hair, he put on a nice shirt and then he went down to the hotel bar hoping to meet somebody. And as soon as he got there, he saw this woman standing standing there in a red dress. She had long dark hair, deep brown eyes, red lips, and he was totally enchanted by her. He instantly had a crush on her. It even says in this creepypasta that he fell in love with her upon seeing her. So he gathered up some courage and walked over to her hoping they could strike up a conversation. So he went up and smiled and asked if he could buy her a drink. But all she did was put her hand up like this and rejected him. And that really hurt him. He felt really rejected disappointed so he walked back to his hotel room. Now the next day he went down to the bar he saw this woman in the red dress again and he thought you know what I'm gonna give this one last shot. 
that. So he walked up to her and said, my name's Josh, what's yours? And once again, she put her hand up like this, but what she said was so mean. She says, I would rather chew my own leg off than talk to you. And this is quite a mean response. And listen, ladies, you have the right to not talk to somebody if you don't want to, but I feel like there's a way to do it like respectfully. So he felt sad and once again went to his room. Now the next day he was exploring the town and he came across this old woman who was selling stuff by the side of the street. She had a sign on this table that said spell casting and black magic and he was instantly intrigued by this. So he walked over to her and he asked her if she had anything that would make someone fall in love with him. So she smiled and pulled out this pink bottle with a red heart on it. She said it was love potion. So of course the man wanted this and eagerly paid for it. And as he was walking away, the old woman called over to him and said, make sure you only put one drop into a drink because if you put more than that, something bad will happen. So at this point of the story, you know that's kind of like foreshadowing, you know something is about to go down. So that night the man strode down to the bar and went up to that woman in the red dress and when she wasn't looking, he put the whole bottle of love potion into her drink. Oh my goodness, man, what are you thinking? And also just generally never put something into someone's drink. Not cool. 20 minutes later, this woman turned to him and she had these huge pupils in her eyes. She was in love with him. She ran over, hugged him. She was like, I love you so much. So he finally got what he wanted. He wanted this affection from this woman in the red dress. So they spent the rest of the day together. It says they were almost like newlyweds. They were so happy to be spending time together. And when morning came, this woman decided to go and surprise him with some breakfast. So she left the hotel and on her way across the street, a car came over and hit her and she unfortunately passed away. So the young man found out and of course he spent the whole day crying. He was so upset, couldn't believe this happened to her because he was having such good luck and all of a sudden this bad luck happened. So that night after finding out about this tragic accident, he got into bed and he just couldn't sleep. He said he felt like something was watching him. He felt as though there was another presence in the room aside from his. So he turned over to go to sleep Sleep, but suddenly saw a crouched figure in the corner of his room. And that crouched figure was wearing a red dress. As he peered closer at this thing, he saw it was the woman that he had fallen in love with, but she was all beaten up, all messed up from the accident. So she just looked very disfigured and scary. Her face was like all messed up. She basically looked like a skeleton. Oh, and she also had no teeth, so it was a very disturbing sight. But before he had any chance to react, she quickly crawled over on top of his bed and started kissing him and saying, oh, I love you so much. And her toothless face was all over him and it's just so disgusting and that's how the story ended. So basically, even in her death, she was still affected by this love potion and still came to him in her afterlife. Ah! I read this and I was so disturbed by it and it just shows you, don't put love potion in people's drinks, especially not the whole bottle. Alright guys, so as I said, because Valentine's Day is coming up, I wanted to do sort of some Valentine's Day themed videos, which is why today's video is about roses, because a lot of people receive roses on Valentine's Day. Not usually black ones, although I feel like I would kind of like that, but red roses symbolize love. So that's why we're going to be talking about black ones, because there are some creepy stuff about it. And by the way, whenever I think about black roses, I think about that song from the TV show Nashville. You know the one that's Scarlet sings. Now you only bring me black roses. If you know, you know. And also roses in general always remind me of Tuxedo Mask. You know when he like throws the rose down at Sailor Moon? Ah, he's my man. There are also a bunch of really weird and sometimes creepy superstitions about roses. It is often said that throwing rose leaves into a fire brings good luck. But on the other hand, they say that a rose should never touch the floor. Otherwise, it'll bring you bad luck. So if you ever drop a rose or like your rose petal falls on the floor, apparently that's not good. Many believe that planting roses near someone's grave protects their soul from evil spirits. And some people believe that if you're holding a rose in your hand and one of the petals fall off while you're holding it, one of your loved ones or friends will pass away soon. 
which is horrible to think about. Also, there's this thing which you may have heard of before, but if you're like stuck between two lovers and you don't know who to choose, take as many rose leaves as there are choices, write the name of your lovers and place them all on water. And apparently the first leaf to sink to the bottom of the water dish is the person that you should choose. So the sinking one is a good one. They also say you can do this if you have a question that you want to ask the universe. You can take three rose petals or three rose leaves, you write yes, no, and maybe on them, and then you place them in a bowl of water and whichever one sinks first is your answer. Although sometimes this can be creepy because I saw there was this comment from a girl who asked the question, is someone watching me right now? And the rose petal sunk. When she looked at it, it said yes. And then she heard something crash through one of her windows in her house and she had to hide in her closet. She called the police and so like literally, so literally her rose knew that her house was about to be broken into? Excuse me? They also say if you place dried rose petals under your mattress, it is said to bring romantic love into your life. It is also thought from history that the rose flower was the key that unlocks fairy castles. And this is like according to old German superstitions. All right, so let's talk about black roses. The black rose can be used as a symbol of death and mourning. And this seems to be the most common representation, but it could also symbolize the end of like a significant life event. So maybe you left a job or you got into a breakup. It basically points towards the tragedy and then the new beginning that you're about to go on. But some people also say that black roses symbolize tragedy or hatred. So like you give someone you hate a black rose, which is not very friendly. Okay, let's talk about a really creepy story. It's called Knock Knock. This is apparently a true story about a girl that began receiving black roses at her front door every day for the 10 days leading up to Valentine's Day. And first she would hear this very faint knocking sound in her house. And it was strange because the person would only ever knock twice, never three times, never four times, only twice. When she'd open the door, she would find one single black rose lying on her doorstep. And there was always like this note wrapped around it that said, will you be my Valentine? Because she had no idea who sent it, she put the flower back down on her porch, not wanting to accept it. And she just like went about her day. This continued to happen. And she'd always look around her street to see if she could spot the person who sent it. And sometimes she would see this like creepy silhouette behind a tree across the street, almost as if someone was trying to hide and watch her pick up the rose. On day 10, she was so fed up with receiving these black roses on her porch that she shouted out to the street, okay, I'll be your Valentine. There, now can you leave me alone? And she took this rose inside her house and then tossed it into the garbage. The next day was Valentine's day and she didn't get a knock at her door all day, which she was relieved about. But around 7 p.m., her luck was over because she heard the faint two knocks. She opened her door, it was dark outside, and for some reason, her porch light was out. But standing at the bottom of her steps was a man dressed in black with his face covered in shadows, and he was holding a black rose in his hands and gestured her to follow him. She refused and ran inside her house and locked the door. But the next day, she was nowhere to be found. The only thing that documented what happened to her the previous days to her going missing was that she wrote in her journal about receiving these roses. Investigators basically speculated that when she accepted this rose on day 10 and brought it into her house, she unknowingly gave this person permission to come and take her away, which is terrifying. So if you ever get unknown gifts on your doorstep, and if you literally don't know who sent them to you or you're like getting them every single day, don't bring them inside and don't open them until you find out who gave them to you. All right, guys, so let's jump right into today's video. The first story is called The Whisper Men. There's a story about a girl that found a strange poem taped to her front door a few years ago on Valentine's Day. Now, this poem was called The Whisper Men, and this is how it went. It says, do you hear the whisper men? The whisper men are near. If you hear the whisper men, then turn away your ear. Do not hear the whisper men, whatever else you do. For once you've heard the whisper men, they stop 
and look at you. So that is a really eerie poem to find outside your house on Valentine's Day. But it wasn't until I did more research on it that I found out it's actually a poem from the show Doctor Who. Now I've never seen the show and I've never heard this poem so I had no idea. But I guess it would be pretty unnerving to still find this tape to your door if you haven't seen the show. Or maybe it's still even scarier if you have seen the show. All right, this next story is called The Window Admirer. This happened to a 19 year old girl named Victoria in 1989. It was just a normal Tuesday morning on February 14th. She was sitting at her breakfast table eating cereal and she was studying for an exam that she had later on that day. Now people say that you get this weird feeling when someone is watching you. It's almost like your body is able to just sense it. So as she was sitting there eating her food, this shiver went down her spine and she glanced over at her living room window which had a perfect view of the kitchen. And there, standing perfectly in the center, was a man with his hands up to his face looking into the house directly at her. She froze in place as she watched this giant smile emerge on his face. She let out a scream and he jumped up and jolted down the street. She sat in her house for what seemed like an hour before she got the courage to actually go and leave for school. But sitting on her front porch was a bundle of flowers with a note that read, How pretty is the face behind the glass, if only I could walk through it. So confused and afraid, she got in her car and drove to school. When she got home that day, she saw that all the windows in her house were opened from the inside. It seemed as though earlier, while she had her front door open looking at his gift, he had snuck inside her house. So that is so creepy. I guess he was hoping she would like go back in her house after he was in there, but thank goodness she ended up going to school. I don't know, that is so creepy. If I were her, I would have just stayed home and like called the police to begin with after seeing that letter, ugh. Next we actually have a very sad true story. It's called The Mysterious Death of Antonio Salvador. At approximately 6 p.m. on February 14th, a 17 year old named Antonio Salvador borrowed his mother's car to go visit his girlfriend. He was planning to deliver a teddy bear to her as a Valentine's Day gift, but Antonio ended up missing his curfew that night, which led his mother to repeatedly text and call his phone trying to figure out where he was. At 4 a.m., Antonio finally answered his phone and let his mother know he was on his way home. But within only half an hour of that phone call, Antonio totaled his mother's vehicle by crashing into a concrete pillar. Antonio was nowhere to be found at the accident scene, but strangely, his shoes were left behind in the car. Now, Antonio remained a missing person until February 27th, when an employee from a scrap metal plant discovered him underwater beneath a dock inside the Houston Ship Channel. He was found approximately two miles from the accident scene. People think that maybe Antonio became disoriented before wandering away from the scene and drowning. But just a lot of these things didn't add up. It was later found out that Antonio had never made it to his girlfriend's house, despite telling his mother that he had, which was really weird. And the Valentine's Day he had was actually found with him, so it was never given to his girlfriend either. One witness told police they saw a dark SUV run Antonio's car into the pillar. And it was also strange that he was found inside a secure area near the scrap metal plant, which apparently was inaccessible to anyone that wasn't a worker there. So this whole story was just really, really odd. And I feel so bad for his family because anytime there's a mysterious death, how do you get closure from that? You just can't. All right, this last story is said to be true as well. It's called Stranger Under the Bed. This happened to a girl back in 2012. She had just moved into an apartment and was one day heading out to pick up her mail while she was talking on the phone to her boyfriend. When she got back to her room, she sat on her bed to read her mail and she accidentally dropped her phone on the floor. It landed under her bed, so she had to lie down on the floor to search for it. But she saw something that caught her eye almost immediately. It was someone under her bed. She was so shocked by seeing this that she had to cover her mouth to stop herself from screaming. This person was lying very still with his back towards her, so she wasn't able to see his face. And because of that, she assumed that he hadn't seen her yet. She tried to be rational and picked up her phone and said, sorry, I dropped my phone. I'm just gonna go take a shower. I'll call you right back. The bathroom was right beside her bed, so she quickly walked in, 
locked the door, turned the shower on, and jumped out the bathroom window. Her apartment was on the first floor, so it wasn't a very far drop. She called the police and she gave them the keys when they arrived. And only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin, tired looking man. His eyes apparently looked really crazy, but he never tried to get away. But the police told her something very unnerving. When they first walked into her apartment, they saw the man standing in front of her bathroom door, holding a piece of a broken mirror, just waiting for her to get out of the shower. They said he must have somehow crept into her entry door when she was getting her mail and hid under her bed. This story gives me the creeps so much. So obviously this man knew that she had seen him under her bed and thought she was actually taking a shower and was just waiting outside for her to finish up. So it's a good thing she jumped out her window and called the police. I don't even know what I would do in that situation. I can't believe she didn't scream. Okay, so let's get into the history of Hershey's Kisses. Hershey's Kisses is a brand of chocolate produced by the Hershey Company in 1907. The bite-sized pieces of chocolate have a distinctive shape, sometimes described as a flat bottom teardrop. Hershey's Kisses chocolates are wrapped in squares of lightweight aluminum foil. They have been one of the most popular candies to have on Valentine's Day. But you may be surprised to learn that Hershey's wasn't the first company to come out with these tear shaped kisses chocolates. It turns out a competitor named Henry Oscar Wilbur released a remarkably similar product in 1894 called the Wilbur Bud. The Wilbur Bud achieved its shape through the cumbersome process of molding. So basically melted chocolate was literally poured onto something and it gave it that sort of teardrop look and then it was left there to solidify. It was not wrapped in foil. And so Hershey saw this and they streamlined the process process with a machine that formed the right shape automatically with a nozzle plopping kiss after kiss onto a cooled conveyor belt for speedy delivery down the assembly line. And apparently this nozzle also makes like a kissing sound whenever it releases the chocolate, which I think, was that on purpose or not? So yeah, basically the Wilbur Buds were like handmade. It took such a long time and Hershey's had a huge factory. And they saw that people didn't want to carry around like the chocolates without the foil because it was melting in people's hands. And that's why they decided to come out with this foil to go around them, which was also put on by the machines as well. Everything was just so easy with Hershey. And since Hershey was already incredibly popular in the early 1900s, these teardrop chocolates took off and a lot of people forgot about the Wilbur Buds. I kind of feel bad about that I feel like a lot of history of candy companies they saw like another small business doing something and they're like yeah I can do that better so don't forget about the Wilbur Buds okay they started it okay so let's get into some weird facts Hershey's made a kiss that tipped the scales at more than 30,000 pounds to celebrate its 100th anniversary putting it on display at Chocolate World in Hershey Pennsylvania in 2007 obviously this was like the largest chocolate ever made that's insane the kiss machines in Hershey, Pennsylvania run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Apparently each day they make 70 million kisses. That's insane. Apparently if you lined up all the kisses that they made in a year, it would span 300,000 miles. Also take note of the street lights when strolling Chocolate Avenue in Hershey, Pennsylvania. More than a hundred are shaped like Hershey's kisses wrapped and unwrapped. Apparently these were installed in 1963 and they're pretty interesting to see. It reminds me of like a dog Dr. Seuss world or something like everything in this area is just like chocolate themed and weird. Hershey's Kissmobile has traveled 250,000 miles giving out samples and sparking smiles since its debut in 1997. Like these vehicles literally just hold tons of chocolates in them and like I'm just I'm fascinated. Another weird fact is that Hershey and his wife Kitty had tickets to board the Titanic on its maiden voyage but something made them return home instead. They had some business thing that kept them from getting on the Titanic but could you imagine if they did because we all know what happens and then who knows where Hershey's chocolates would be now and have you looked at the logo because there is a sideways kiss hiding between the K and the I in kisses and now you'll never be able to unsee it I remember a few years ago I did like a whole video on like secret symbols and logos I love it I went to school for graphic design and I love that they put a secret kiss in their logo all right so let's get into the creepypasta this 
this is called the secret message this is about a girl that found a little package of kisses in her locker on Valentine's Day she had no idea how the person put them there as she obviously had a lock on her locker but she was just so excited by the idea that someone in her school had a crush on her she brought them home and sat on her bed and opened the package and eight Hershey's kisses rolled out and she picked one up to eat when she noticed something very strange so you know that little paper that sticks out of the top that says kisses on it I presume they put this in there to make like opening the chocolate a lot easier you just like pull it and it just like unwraps well instead of saying kisses on that paper it was this long sheet of paper that was stuffed inside the chocolate and there was like sloppy handwriting on it written in pen so she pulled it out and the first one said your hair is so pretty I love the way you brush it she pulled out the second one and it said I love the red sneakers you put on every morning now she kind of thought it was sweet that every single kiss that she had had something nice written about her like this person who had a crush on her took the time to do this for her so at first she was like really flattered about this then the third one said I love that you read books on the bus to school but then things started to take a turn and the messages got creepier and creepier by the moment the fourth one said I love that you turn your bedroom light off at 10 p.m. on the dot each night are you kidding me then the fifth one said, I love that you bring a flashlight with you to get water from the kitchen at 3 a.m. So you're telling me he's literally watching her at 3 a.m.? The sixth one said, I love that when you're home alone, you put on Disney movies as background noise. So I guess she's not really home alone, is she? The seventh one said, I love that you still snuggle with a stuffed rabbit at night, even in high school. Oh boy. And the last one, the best one of them all, the eighth one said, I love that you never see me me looking through your window. Ah! Okay, so obviously this took a very dark turn. That is terrifying. This actually reminds me of the story that I just did about the watcher who was like stalking that family. Clearly this girl is being watched and stalked, getting creepy messages. Honestly guys, there's nothing worse than getting anonymous messages that are creepy because literally it makes you paranoid. You're always looking around. You have no idea who sent them to you. Like, no thank you. I decline. If I got this, it'd be going right to the police. So thankfully, I believe this is only a creepypasta. Hopefully that is the case. We have a game called Purple Hearts, which as you can tell is the title of today's video. This game is bizarre. Now, Purple Hearts is actually a very old game. It dates back to the 80s and 90s, I believe. This game is basically where you explore other worlds while you're dreaming. So one person in this game has to be the sleeper and the other person has to be the watcher. So there's two people. One person gets into their bed and tries to fall asleep and the other person sits beside them and watches over them. The person who's watching has to say Purple Hearts hearts, purple hearts purple hearts over and over again until that sleeper drops into a dream. Then they lead the sleeper through their dream, encouraging them to describe where they are, what they see, and anything that might be going on around them. Now, when the sleeper starts to describe seeing purple hearts in their dream, it's time to wake them up and bring them back to the real world. Now, in order to wake up the sleeper, you have to tell them to reach out and grab one of the purple hearts that they're seeing. Once the sleeper has grabbed the purple heart in their dream, they should awake in the physical world. Now, the rumor is if you're not woken up right away after you see these hearts in your dream, then for the rest of your life, you'll always see those shapes in your vision. Imagine always seeing purple hearts wherever you go. Like that sounds super distracting, but also kind of cool. Like, you know how sometimes when you look outside, you see those like floaters in your vision? Imagine those being giant purple hearts. Weird. Next, we have something called the thumb game. This is probably one of the strangest games that I read about. You have to gather together a group of friends and you all have to stand in a circle and you have to grab onto each other's thumbs. So you're not holding hands, you're holding thumbs if that makes sense. As you're doing that, you have to imagine a particular environment. It could be a magical place, a mythical place, a waterfall, another planet. You have to all decide on what you're gonna imagine. You'll soon find yourself in the environment that you've imagined. Except when you look down at your thumb, 
you'll realize that it's missing. And now you have to go on a quest to find your thumb in this other world that you created. You have to do this as soon as possible and return to your original location before time is up. Because if you don't, you may not return to the real world and you'll be stuck there forever. Isn't that such a strange concept? And how do you know how much time you have? Like, how do you know when time's up? All right, and lastly, we have a game called 11 Miles. Now, the rules of this game might seem very simple, but apparently it's the complete opposite of that. You need to get into your car and drive until you locate a specific road. Now, apparently you'll just know it's the right road when you get there. You'll just have this feeling. And for most people, it's a road that runs through a forest. Then continue to drive down that road until you reach the end. And if you do it successfully, you'll be granted a wish. But like I said, the actual drive won't be easy. There are these rules for what you can and can't do as you drive through those 11 miles. And I'll read them out to you right now and they get weird and weirder. So on mile one, it says, if you get cold, you may turn your heater on. Mile two, if you haven't already turned the heater on, now would be a good time to do so. If you do not, you might regret it later. Mile three, ignore any shadows in the trees, no matter how human they may seem. Mile four, ignore any voices you may hear, no matter how human they may seem. Mile five, ignore the vanishing trees, the sudden appearance of a lake, and the glowing of the moon. Mile six, ignore the returning of the trees, the disappearance of the stars, and the flickering of your headlights. If your radio turns on, ignore that too. Ignore it no matter what it says, but do not attempt to turn it off. Mile 7. Ignore, again, any voices you may hear, no matter how close they may sound. Do not turn around, even if the voices appear to be coming from the back seat. Mile 8. Slow down, but do not stop. Break if your headlights flicker, but do not stop. No matter how cold it gets, do not stop. No matter who or what you might see, do not stop. Mile 9. Your vehicle may stall. Close your eyes. Attempt to restart your vehicle. Do not open your eyes. No matter what you hear, do not open your eyes. When your vehicle starts, hit the gas as fast as you can. When the mile is over, you may open your eyes. Mile 10. Do not look in your rear view mirror. Mile 11. Your vehicle may lose power, but continue to move let it. Okay, so after this, you're done your 11 miles. So let's talk about this reward, they say. Drive until the road dead ends, and then you can relax. Imagine your deepest desire. It says that if your desire was an object, check your trunk. If it is smaller than that, check your back seat. If it is smaller than that, check your pockets. But if your desire was non-material, return to your life and check there. If it does not appear immediately, wait. Be patient. It will come. This first case is about Esther Beck, and she went missing on February 2nd of 1923. Now, she was 27 years old, so obviously she doesn't qualify as a kid, but her case was so interesting that I had to include it in this video. In December of 1922, Esther Beck was a nursing student at Indiana School of Nursing in Bloomington, Indiana. Apparently, in 1923, Esther suffered this nervous breakdown while she was at school, and she had to go home because of it. And it's actually very unclear as to what happened to her to cause her to have such an emotional reaction. And then on February 1st of 1923, Esther was living with her parents and around 4.30 p.m. she told her father that she wanted to go on a walk. She also told him that she'd be having dinner at her sister's house. And she was last seen walking out of her parents' front door. On February 2nd, she hadn't returned home and her dad thought that she must have spent the night at her sister's house. When he realized she never made it there, he immediately called the police. And the search for her started right away. They even got the whole community involved in this. They walked far into the country, pretty much as far as they thought a woman would be able to travel on foot in the blistering cold weather. And about five days into the search, they found her and it wasn't good. She was about 15 feet from the road and it appeared as though she tried to hop over a fence and had fallen. But what was strange was that one of her shoes was found right beside her and the other she was found way off in the distance along with her hat. Her death was definitely very mysterious. The whole community was very confused. Why was she trying to climb a large fence into a farmer's field? Basically in the middle of nowhere. And what's even eerier is that several missing people have been found in that exact spot over the years. Now they found that no foul play was involved. She literally just fell over a fence, was not able to get up and froze in the snow. So why didn't she go to her sister's 
house, why was she in the middle of nowhere? The whole thing was just very odd. The next case is for Andrew Sexton. He went missing on February 25th of 2006, and he was 21 years old at the time. Andrew Sexton was from St. Anthony in Newfoundland. He loved the outdoors and he knew the area very, very well. On February 26th, Andrew and his friends got onto their snowmobiles and planned a trip to a cabin in Goose Cove. It was only about a four mile trip and they had done this route so many times before. Like they knew the way perfectly. They left at 10 a.m. that day. They all arrived at the cabin shortly after but didn't stay long because they knew that a snowstorm was coming and they wanted to get home before then. So they all drove back on their separate snowmobiles and when they arrived home they realized that Andrew wasn't with them. So the police were called and that is when the search began. The snowstorm hit the area and it was pretty bad, making their search even harder. So they didn't find him on the first day, but on the second day they actually found just his snowmobile, but he himself wasn't anywhere near it. What's strange is that the snowmobile was pointed in the wrong direction to get home. It still had a full tank of gas, the keys were in the ignition, and it was operable. So the question was, where the heck was Andrew? The police eventually got these bloodhounds to look for him, but no clues were ever found. So the sad thing is Andrew was never actually located even till this day. Some people in the area say he was abducted by aliens, which is obviously a little crazy. And this case was just so strange because Andrew knew Newfoundland like the back of his hand. He knew all of the outdoors. He had been everywhere before. And the snowstorm hadn't really even begun while they were on their way back home. The friends made it back perfectly, but he was not behind them. They even had divers search the frozen waters to see if maybe he had fallen in and there was nothing. People are just so confused as to why he would just leave his snowmobile there. The large vehicle is easy for people to locate, it's super warm, and it was still operational. So this case will always be a mystery. Alright, the next case is about Jim Beveridge. He went missing on February 7th of 1981 and he was only nine years old. On February 7th of 1981, Jim was hiking a trail on the side of Mount Palomar with his two brothers. Jim was at the back of the group and somehow disappeared. The brothers tried to look for Jim but couldn't find him anywhere, so they all ran back to their car and notified their parents. And they called the police, but as soon as they got there, it started pouring rain. He was last seen wearing a coat, tennis shoes, and long pants. The first day, they were unable to find him, and on the third day, they found his coat and one of his shoes high up on the mountain. Like an area on the mountain that would be extremely difficult for a child to climb climb, like super steep rocks everywhere. And unfortunately, on the fifth day of the search, they found him on this steep side of the hill and he did not survive the cold. Now the coroner didn't find any foul play involved. They said that he literally just died of exhaustion. Now there are a couple very strange things about this case. The first is that Jim's godfather actually went missing as well while he was looking for Jim. He was missing for the entire five days and when police found him, he was so tired, wet, and hungry, and he barely survived. The other strange thing is, why was Jim missing his clothing? Why would he remove his coat and his shoes? It was freezing outside, it was raining, and it's really eerie how many missing persons cases has this happen, where investigators will find their clothes way far somewhere else than where they find them. Now, I have heard that when you have hypothermia, for some reason your brain tells you to take off your warm clothing. It's very strange, so that could have happened. Now there was also a seven-year-old girl named Jill that had the exact same thing happen to her in the same area of this mountain. It's always kind of unsettling when you hear about a similar case that happened in the same area. Lastly, we have a case about a boy named Guy Heckel. He went missing on February 3rd of 1973 and he was 11 years old at the time. Guy was spending the weekend with a Boy Scout group near Cedar Rapids and on February 3rd at 8 p.m. Guy was playing capture the flag with the other boys. At one point, he himself had the flag and he was running to find a position that he could hide. But when the scouts went to look for him, he couldn't be located. They all just returned to their tents and went to bed without telling any of the adults. And it wasn't until the troop leaders did a bed check later on and found out that he wasn't in his tent. So they called the police and they searched that night until 2.30 a.m. and didn't find him. 10 days went by with no sight of Guy or any clues as to where he would be. And at that point, one of the other Boy Scouts came forward with some very creepy information. He said that the three days leading up to Guy's disappearance, an 
an unknown person would open the door to their tent and would shine a flashlight onto them and then would walk away. And it was never discovered who exactly was doing that. All of the troop leaders said they weren't. So it was almost like a stranger was checking on each tent with a flashlight, super eerie. Then on February 28th, they found Guy's jacket in a river about half a mile from the campsite. Now the strangest thing about this discovery was that the jacket was fully zipped up. It's not like he had removed it and thrown it on the ground somewhere. It was like someone removed it, fully zipped it up, and then put it in the river. Because obviously you can't get your coat off without like pulling the zipper down. To this day, Guy was never found, and it's actually scary how many kids have gone missing while at a girls or boy scout group, and also while playing games. It's so weird how that happens. And All right, let's get started on the very first case. Bonita Bickwit disappeared with her boyfriend, Mitchell Weiser, on July 27, 1973. The pair was hiking up to a concert festival in New York. The last person to see the couple was a truck driver who gave them a ride to the concert. However, it is unclear whether the couple actually reached the concert or not. Originally, police just thought that Bonita and Mitchell had run off together. The pair was very much in love and had even exchanged wedding rings earlier in the summer. Because this is a very common thing, if couples are young and in love, a lot of the time they do run off together. They don't necessarily disappear completely, but they do run off. So the police originally thought that, yeah, this was probably the case. But after talking to their friends and family, people who knew them said that they were acting very, very strange before they left. There have been a few unconfirmed sightings of the couple, but no trace or evidence has actually been found. And there have been a lot of speculation that while the couple was hiking to the concert, maybe because it was so hot that day, they went to the river and accidentally drowned. No one really knows what happened, but the couple was so, so in love. So it's just bizarre how they just like vanished. Okay, let's move on to the next case. On March 5th, 1957, William Patterson and his wife Margaret vanished from their home in El Paso, Texas. The couple wasn't reported missing until five months after they vanished because their neighbor thought the couple had been on an extended vacation. That is so crazy to me. Imagine going missing and no one knows or reports it for five months. I mean, I know my family and friends would report me in like a day because like they wouldn't have heard from me, but it's just so bizarre how this couple could go missing for that long and not even be like suspected of being missing. When the case was finally opened, police investigators found that the couple had left their car and their cat behind and that their house was oddly in complete disarray. It's very strange how their neighbors thought this couple was on vacation when clearly their car was still parked in the driveway. That doesn't make any sense to me. The neighbors said that on the night of their supposed disappearance, the couple seemed very upset. A short while later, a letter was received from William that provided provided instructions as to who his properties were going to be distributed to. Investigators suspected that it was not William who wrote this letter, but one of his employees. That is just so bizarre. And they were never found, so this case was never solved, and it'll always just be super mysterious, and no one knows what happened to them. This next one is really, really weird, especially because it's about two parents. Claude and Martha Sue Shelton disappeared from Gary's trailer park after they tucked their three children into bed to go to sleep. After the Sheltons kissed their children goodnight, they drove away in their 1967 Ford Galaxy and were never heard from again. Evidence of where the couple could have gone is scarce. Their car has never been recovered and nobody remembers seeing them the night of their disappearance. And what's really, really strange, first of all, the couple has three children to look after, but family and friends of this couple said that they loved their children dearly and would never leave them alone. So these three children are now being raised by their grandmother and they'll never know what happened to their parents. It's so bizarre. If my parents just like got up and left, I would just not believe they did it on purpose because like they love me. So it's just weird. Let's move on to this next case, which is like my worst fear. And that is the ocean. Ugh. 
Thomas and Eileen Cassidy were a married couple who were stranded at sea while they were scuba diving with a group at St. Crispin's Reef. It wasn't discovered that the couple was missing until two days after the boat that transported the group to go scuba diving left them behind. When it was finally discovered that the couple was missing, an air and sea search took place, but there was no sign of the couple. So there are a bunch of theories about what happened to them, but people think that they just drowned and were eaten by sharks, which is horrible. But that makes me so nervous to go on any like scuba diving boat or like group because how did the people like doing this scuba diving day not notice they weren't on the boat when they went back? Like they could have just been out scuba diving like having a great time together and the boat just left them out in the middle of the ocean with these sharks. Oh, I hate that. I'm getting like chills. Ooh. Let's move on to the next case. Camden Sylvia and her boyfriend Michael Sullivan were last seen jogging on November 7th, 1997. After they had failed to return home, Sylvia's mother went into their apartment to investigate. She found that everything was in its place. The only things that were missing were two pairs of running shoes, a set of house keys, and Sylvia's bag. And there's absolutely no evidence about what happened to them. There are theories, but nothing has been confirmed. Like just imagine being that mother, like your daughter is just on a jog and she never comes back. And I feel like that happens a lot. Like a ton of people get abducted while out like running or jogging, like depending on where you're running, ugh, be careful. All right, the next case. In April of 1980, Charles Romer and his wife Catherine were on a trip back to their home in Scarsdale, New York from their winter house in Miami, Florida. The wealthy couple checked into the Holiday Inn located in Brunswick, Georgia, after which they unloaded their luggage and headed back out in their vehicle. But that will be the last time anyone would ever see them. A highway patrolman would later report that he had seen the missing vehicle south of Brunswick parked near a group of restaurants, but this was not verified. The police also looked inside of their car nothing was amiss, there was no evidence of foul play, everything seemed totally normal. So it's just weird because they checked into a hotel, put their stuff in the rooms, and then maybe went out to dinner, but their car was left there and they were nowhere to be seen. So those are all of the couple's cases that we're gonna talk about today. I feel like this should be sort of a theme for the rest of the Missing series, and maybe not necessarily couples, maybe like creepy stalkers, or like something that relates to like love in a dark way. So let's First one, you're sweet enough to eat my valentine. There is literally a girl cooking in a stew pot right now with fire everywhere. This photo makes me so uncomfortable. She doesn't even look that happy. She's like, oh my gosh, get me out of here, please. Like if someone gave me this card, I'd be like, are you like a serial killer or something? And I feel like most of these cards have a theme of like violence, which is very unsettling. And I know like, yeah, they're just jokes. They're just Valentine's Day cards. But I feel like these have been taken a bit too far. <laughs> like I've received a lot of joke themed Valentine's Day cards in my life and nothing, nothing has been like this before. See, like this next one. It strikes me that I love you. And it's this guy who sees this girl who's happily, you know, with this boy. They're obviously like in a relationship or hanging out. And there's this guy behind them about to like, you know what I mean? He's gonna, you know, I don't want to say too much because you know what I mean? He is not happy that she is with him. And I don't know, it strikes me that I love you. Yeah, if a guy sent me this and I was like happily in a relationship, I would call the police. I would call the police. Okay, this next one doesn't say anything scary, but what the heck is going on here? This goat looks like a, I don't know. It looks like it's going to come and get me in my sleep. Be a little lamb and take a gamble with me. And it's like this sheep with a huge head, scary eyes in a dress. I don't know what is going on or who drew this or who thought this would be cute. Like, do people think this is cute? Like, I'm gonna have a dream about this lamb tonight. The next one, oh my gosh, this girl's eyes. <laughs> Just wait till I start. I'm gonna ski right into your heart. You're mine. Um, she looks a little bit evil. I feel like she looks like a Disney villain or something. What's with those eyes? You know what her eyes look like? Betty Boop. Do you guys remember that cartoon? And like Betty Boop had a lot of very dark aspects to it. Like I know this is like not a part of the video, but you know how I have my movies series? So I'm gonna cover all of like my childhood movies and stuff. And then I was thinking of doing TV, get it? T-V-E-E. -E. And then covering like a bunch of shows that we all know that have some really creepy conspiracies and just dark things in it because Betty Boop was one of those, just so you know. Anyway, this is a very scary card. The next one, oh my goodness. Yes, I said you are my Valentine. That's a, a dummy. What are those things called? Uh, those things 
that you, the puppets? I don't remember what they're called. Aren't they dummies? <laughs> I don't know, I feel weird calling them that. But uh, yeah, that's creepy. And back then, those were all the rage, you know? People used to laugh at shows where people like went up with the puppet talking things and those just scared me as a kid. And still now. Guess who, Valentine? The boy who sent this card to you thinks you're swell. Now please guess who. So like what it says isn't that creepy. It's just what he's doing. It looks like he's full on like choking her. Like she has no place to breathe. Imagine someone coming up to you and being like, guess who? Guess who? And like they're pressing like on your face. Look, she can barely even, she looks, she looks very uncomfortable. She's like, what the heck is this guy doing to me right now? I don't know. I don't like this card at all, just personally. I feel like I'm suffocating with her, you know? Okay. <sighs> Ronald McDonald. I just have a love-hate relationship with this man. Well, with this clown, I should say. I mean, I have so many good memories with him. You know, I used to go and get my Happy Meals all the time as a kid, but he is freaky. Whoever thought that this guy should be the mascot for McDonald's is a little bit messed up because this scares people. It says, to my special Valentine, next to Ronald McDonald, I love you best. <sighs> I hope whoever got this card at least got like a happy meal with it. You know what I mean? Cause that would make this card worth it. Cause you know, it's scary, but at least you have food, right? So the next one, why the frigid air Valentine? I'm ready to be defrosted. What does that even mean? It's not even cute. I don't understand. This girl is frozen inside of a freezer. She like dying, like, I don't know why this is cute. I almost feel like it's kind of a threat. Like if you don't be my Valentine, you're gonna end up in the freezer. <laughs> like it's kind of scary. Um, This next one is very unsettling. It's no accident my liking you Valentine and she's clearly about to be hit by a car. She's not yet, but it's implying that. And his tongue's out like he's having a great time. Like he's like, I'm gonna run people over today. Like he doesn't care? Like what is going on? And guys, like there are way worse ones that I can't even show on my channel because I gotta keep up the monetization stuff. Like these are the nicer versions of the ones I can't show. So imagine those ones that I can't show. If this one's bad, imagine the ones I could not show. The next one, nobody loves me. Guess I'll go out to the garden and eat fuzzy worms. Who says that? Is that a thing? If you get rejected, you go outside and eat bugs? Because I have never done that. And I've had some bad heartbreaks, okay? But I have not been out in the garden eating fuzzy worms because, ew, who, who, is, who is buying these cards and giving it to the people they love? No, 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 no. That should not be a thing. Like imagine like asking somebody out and they're like, no thanks. And you're like, that's fine. I'm just gonna go outside. If you need to find me, I'll be behind the trees in the garden eating ladybugs and weird worms. Like, no, go to a psych ward. Um, okay. I'm plum crazy over you. Scoot off with me and be my Valentine. Plum crazy. Is that a term? It must be a vintage term because I've never heard anybody say that before. I'm plum crazy over you? What? And he has like a box of plums? Is that like a box of heads? Because his head is a plum. So is everyone else's in this world a plum too? Does that even make any sense? Uh, the next one, it just says message of love and there's a creepy clown on there. Why is that Valentine's Day related? I don't know. And he's holding an apple. It reminds me of like Snow White, like eat this apple and be asleep forever. <laughs> like what is this clown doing? The next one, I may be a dummy for asking, but wouldn't you like to be my Valentine? See, this is another dummy one. So they are called dummies. I thought they were called something else. If you know the other word that I'm trying to think of, please comment it down below because there's another word. But yeah, dummies were like a thing because so many cards that I found online had these guys in it. Why? I guess people just weren't afraid of them back then, which is like, it's cool, but they've made so many horror movies about these guys alone that no, 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 no. I ain't kidding, Valentine. I'd like to kidnap you. Okay, that's really normal. <laughs> okay, it's a pirate, so I get it's like a joke. Pirates kidnap people and do bad things, but I don't know how people, like, do people get a good response when they give these cards? Like, do the girls or guys just like chuckle and be like, of course I'll be your Valentine. Or do they like say it because they're scared? Are they like, of course I'll be your Valentine because I don't want to know what will happen if I won't be. Uh, next one. I promise not to bite if you'll give me a kiss. How about it, Valentine? What is he? Is he a wolf? Is he, what, what are we looking at right now? The big bad wolf? It's terrifying. And what's on his head? Like the Valentine's Day crown? Okay, next one. Oh my goodness. Don't be afraid. It's only me, your Valentine. What? Isn't it weird how most of these like cards have 
have little kid drawings on them, like it's little kids giving the Valentine's Day cards. Like, are, are little kids buying these primarily? Is it adults buying these? Because both is weird. Next, I'm in a stew over you, Valentine. Okay, so it's a dog in a hot stew. This is like the very first one with the girl in the pot of fire, basically. I guess that's a theme. People just like to make that a theme for Valentine's Day cards. Be mine or there will be war. See, it's another kid making a creepy little smile, holding something scary, making a threat. Oh my gosh, if my child came to me and was like, hey mom, I want to buy Betty this card so she'll be my Valentine. I'd be like, son, no. You're gonna make one yourself and make it happy, okay? We're not doing this threatening stuff. Oh my goodness. Valentine, what's the secret formula? You drive me batty. What is this, Valentine's Day or Halloween? I feel like I have nothing else to say but just stare at it very weirdly. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm speechless at this point because I've seen so many that my brain is just on overload mode. You strike me just right. Why are these so violent? Why are these so violent? Like maybe it's just me, but if someone wants to give me a Valentine's Day card, it'd be, it'd be so nice if it was just something sweet. Sweet and short, short and sweet. You know what I mean? I want you to be my Valentine. It doesn't seem to be a secret. Okay, so this is supposed to be written in paint, but I don't know about you, but it looks like something else. Why would they choose red to write on the walls? When this person was drawing this card, were they not like, oh, you know what? It looks a little bit, a little bit like blood. I wanna get into the mindset of these people. I just wanna know what they were thinking. I share my heart with you, and I guess he's giving her a piece of his heart to eat. So, and you can't even see their faces, which is creepier, because I, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I see like paintings or drawings where the person's face is hidden by something or looking somewhere else, I'm always just like, I wanna see the face. Because if I don't see the face, I'm gonna think about it all day. Is that weird? I feel like that's really weird. I'm just like paranoid.